Okay, today we're gonna to start with a number talk. Don't forget what our target is today. We're gonna to be able to solve equations that include rational numbers with rational number solutions. Just kidding, let me start over. That was <laughs> Dixon here. Welcome to the Math Reflective. I'm really excited to talk to you about another instructional routine today called Number Talk. Now, Number Talks aren't new, and I'm sure a lot of you have already done a Number Talk, but for me personally, I used to be a little bit intimidated about Number Talks and how to do them in the classroom. As a teacher, I thought I wasn't very good at them. So we were trying as a math team in the last couple of years to intentionally plan for and do more Number Talks, but it seems like it was always something that we, because of time's sake, and shorter class periods we just put off and never got to, or if we did do them, I often let my co-teacher, who's a math interventionist, Mary Dooms, do the number talk so I could kind of watch how she modeled it with students. This year, though, we finished our first pilot year with Open Up Resources 6-8 Math. It's an inquiry-based math program, and I absolutely love it. It's one of the reasons why I started to do a vlog on YouTube, because of the experiences I'm having with it and the need and desire to just reflect and grow professionally in doing that inquiry-based program. So built into this program and this resource, which is authored by Illustrative Mathematics, are a lot of number talks, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, which is awesome because it's already planned and it's already there and it's something I can execute and it's already embedded in the program. The best way to use a number talk in the classroom is to use it as a warm-up or an invitation to the math. Well, what is it exactly? A number talk is a routine that helps students build computational fluency and helps them develop their number sense. It really focuses a lot on the mathematical practices of using precision because you are prompting them to use careful word choice and talk like a mathematician. It helps them to see patterns and look for that repeated use of regular reasoning. And then it also helps students to make use of structure, which is mathematical practice number seven. So it taps into a lot of prior knowledge that they already have, and they're having to compute or calculate a problem, but they're bringing in all this other uh, knowledge that they know and routines that they know how to do, and even teaches them and builds on what they already know about um, number properties. Typically, a teacher would write a problem on the board and ask students to men use mental math to solve it. We have a strategy where we have students put their fist to their chest. That way, other students won't get stressed out by their hand raise and they already have an answer. So fist to chest to shows that you're engaged and committed to doing the problem. And then you put your finger out once if you have one strategy or way to solve it. And then again, if you can think of another strategy. Because of course, we're always trying to build on them and their minds as mathematicians and help them to think of many different methods and ways to solve a problem. So we look for a student after the appropriate wait time and we call on them and we ask how they solved it. And basically we write down their thinking on the board. Now the important job of the teacher is to be the guide on the side and ask the proper questions. So the questions might be, can you tell me more about that? What made you think this? Or why did you use this operation? That way we're eliciting student thought and student idea and their peers are able to listen to what other students are saying and maybe they have the same idea. So then I'll say, did somebody else think of the same method but want to restate it in their own words? There again, you have access for everyone because they could have listened to that student talk about their response and then they can include the same type of method but just put it on their, in their own words. Another question that the teacher might ask is, did somebody solve it with a different approach? And that way you're building their repertoire of using many different methods. We want to try to find at least two to three different strategies for each problem. But of course, we can't call in every student. And sometimes for time's sake, you just need to move on. You only want a number talk to be five or 10 minutes long. But I have to admit, I kind of go crazy with the intelligence of the children. And I just love to write all over the board their responses. And I know that I've gone more than 10 minutes before. And I even take a picture of it at the end because I'm so proud of all the thinking and all the growth that it shows that students are, are learning and expanding on their knowledge. So then we go on to a next problem. The second problem might be related to the first. So they could look at the strategies that were solved, and of course they're recorded on the board so everyone can see them. They're on display and they're valued. But a student might actually look at the first way we solved the first one and think, wow, I can use that to solve this. So there again, they're able to apply things that they just learned. So we continue to write those strategies on the board, 
usually there's three to four different computational problems that, we're, that we do. And then after we're done, you transition into the next activity and explain to students how it's going to build into what they're going to do next. I'd like to show you a short clip now of a, my sixth grade advanced math classroom. We're working with the seventh grade curriculum, and at this particular time, we're in unit five, lesson 15, and we're doing rational numbers. All right, eyes on me, students. We're gonna start with a number talk today. We are on lesson 15 of unit five. five. Today's target is I will be able to solve equations that include rational numbers and rational number solutions. So we're gonna start with a number talk. Remember for a number talk, we're gonna start with our fist to chest, so everyone should have fist to chest. That way that when you have a solution or don't have a solution, that's private just for you and me to see. When you get one solution or strategy, or you get the answer, just put a finger out so I know who to call on. All right, I'm gonna show you one at a time. We'll make this equation true. Emma. So I got one because three times five is 15 and five times three is 15, and the same, no, same number over the same number equals one. Okay, and any time, so you multiply straight across, that's what we know about the numerator and denominator, you'll get 15 fifteenths. When you have the same numerator and denominator, we get one. Excellent. Next problem. C times D equals one. Show me when you have a strategy or a second possibility for a solution or a third. Evan. Uh, it's three fifths and five thirds. Cause... Okay, you're saying C could be three fifths and D could be five thirds. Is he correct? Yeah. 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 Okay. What's another possibility to make this equation true? What's another possibility? Ashley. I just did one times one equals one. Okay, then C and D are the same value? We would want different values, because if it was if they're both one, they'd both be C. So can you revise your thinking? Okay, two times one half. So C is two and D is one half and that would equal one. Can I have one more strategy? Show me fist to chest so I know who to call on. Abdullah. Well, so I thought that you could take like any fraction and then maybe do like the reciprocal and then that would be one. Okay, can I repeat what you said? He said you could take any number, you said specifically fraction, and then multiply it by its reciprocal and that would be one. So any number, we could say like A over B or C over D times its reciprocal, B over A is going to be one. And that was the point of that problem. So excellent job. Let's do a one, two, three clap for him. One, two, three. The next one is 11 plus F equals zero. Fist to chest. Emily, um, what is F? What solution for F would make this equation true? Negative 11. 11 plus negative 11 equals zero. Does everyone confirm that? Yes. One, two, three. Good job, Emily. Negative six plus six equals E. What is the solution that will make this equation true? What value do we need for E? Gabe. Uh, negative six plus six equals zero. Okay, what did we learn from those last two examples? What did they have in common? What did you learn? What pattern can you generalize? Uh, any number uh, plus its opposite is zero. Excellent job, one, two, three. I'm realizing as I grow and develop as a teacher that the more I let go and let the students lead and show what they need and show what they know, the more successful we are in the classroom and I feel like the delivery of the instruction is more valuable to them. And that the beauty and the math comes from the students building that knowledge together and adding to each other's reasoning. And then the display that's on the board, um, just looking at all the different ways that they think about problems. 
Now that I think about it, an even better way to provide greater access to all students might be to put a word bank on the board. If you feel that there are English language learners or striving learners that might not be able to come up with vocabulary at first and they're not used to doing this and they feel a little bit reticent to do it, maybe putting a few words that we might use in today's number talk would be helpful for them. And then they would have something you know, right away that they could grab onto and feel comfortable and confident. Honestly, when I tell my students we're doing a number talk, there's usually a little bit of cheering going on. For some reason, it's very relaxing routine to them. They love starting the math this way. One of the things I loved about the clip that you just watched was when Adolfo was generalizing that pattern that he was seeing and also when Kate was talking there at the end. So that really is the key to the lesson is that the students bring out the understanding and the concept and solidifying and synthesizing instead of the teacher doing it. Now, of course, if students aren't able to do that and they're not seeing the pattern or the rule or the generalization that I want them to see, I will scaffold in that way before we lead to the next activity. Well, I hope you learned a little bit more about Number Talks maybe than you have before. And just know that I will be posting more videos about Number Talks as I continue a second year pilot with Open Up Resource 6-8 Math. And I'm excited to learn along with you and I'd love to hear from you. Follow me on Twitter at Math Reflective or on Instagram at The Math Reflective. Thank you so much for watching. And if you like this video and would like to see more videos like this, please subscribe to my channel. Are you ready for more?